closer in time. For centuries, Egypt was thought to be the cradle of the domestic cat, but archaeology and genetics have traced the story much further back to the Neolithic villages of the Fertile Crescent about 10,000 years ago. Before agriculture, as humans began storing wild grain, rodents moved in. African-Asian wildcats followed, drawn to the easy prey. The boldest tolerated human proximity, and humans in turn very much tolerated the cats. By 9,500 years ago, a cat was buried beside a human at Silurocampo, Cyprus, near the modern-day city of Pataclesia, a journey only possible by boat, signaling human transport and probable taming. Over millennia, this loose partnership deepened. Egyptian civilization later adopted the domesticated cat, elevating it into art, religion, and law. The wild cat's solitary nature never vanished entirely, but its niche in human settlements was secure. Today's domestic cat is one species, yet its variety rivals many companion animals. The sleek Siamese, fluffy and long-haired Persians, the bare-skinned Sphinx, and countless mixed breeds padding through living rooms, yards, and alleys. Their role is equally varied, rodent control, internet celebrity, and silent confidant. Culturally, cats have wandered from ancient deities to medieval witches' familiars to 21st century memes. They are worshipped, feared, pampered, and ignored, usually on their own terms. Unlike dogs, their domestication was not driven by active human selection for obedience or work, apparently. Instead, cats adapted themselves to human environments while retaining much of their independence. No joke. They thrive in the liminal space between wild and tame, equally at home on a farm or a high-rise balcony. The quiet pat begun in Neolithic granaries endures, a relationship defined by mutual convenience and the occasional deliberate affection. 6,000 years ago, on the Eurasian steppe, the bowtie culture of what is now northern Kazakhstan left traces of corrals, pottery coated with mare's milk residue, and bit-worn teeth. Strong suggestions of early domestication. But just recently, modern genetics has revised the tale of the domestic horse. First, these bowtie horses are not the ancestors of today's mounts. They gave rise instead to the so-named genetically divergent Chevalsky's horse. Second, although horses were long known in Eurasia and Africa, none lived in the Americas when Europeans arrived. Horses actually originated in North America millions of years ago, migrated to Asia during the last Ice Age, then went extinct in the Americas about 10,000 years ago, only to be reintroduced by Spanish colonialists. The lineage that became the modern domestic horse appears later, around 4,200 years ago with the Sintashta culture of the southern Urals. Here we see the first chariots in rich burials and the genetic signature that would sweep across Eurasia, displacing local horse lineages. From Bronze Age chariots to modern racetracks, the domestic horse has carried humans into war, trade, sport, and legend. Breeding has shaped over 400 distinct varieties, from the massive Shire to the fleet Arabian. Culturally, horses have been royal gifts, symbols of status, and engines of empires, from cavalries to the Pony Express. Their impact is truly global. The horse turned grasslands into highways, linked distant cultures, and redefined the speed of human life. Even in the motor age, we still talk in units horsepower. They've left their mark in mythology, too, from the divine steeds of Greek epics to Native American spirit horses. Yet the partnership is fragile. Without human care, domestic horses revert to feral life in a few generations. A reminder that their place beside us was not entirely a matter of subjugation alone, but rather by millennia of shared journeys. We are closer in time to the earliest domestication of the horse than we are to the earliest domestication of the cat by about 4,000 years. And the earliest domestication of the horse is closer in time to the earliest domestication of the cat than it is to us now by about 2,000 years. For a long time, people thought domestic dogs came directly from the gray wolf. New genetic research shows this is almost certainly untrue. Modern dogs and modern wolves are more like cousins, both descended from a wolf-like ancestor that no longer exists. That split may have happened as far back as 41,000 years ago. This Ice Age dog-wolf split was necessary, but not enough on its own for domestication. The first clear proof of a true domestic dog comes much later, about 14,000 years ago at Bon Oberkostel, 
Germany. Here, archaeologists found a grave containing two people and a young dog buried together. The dog had been sick and nursed back to health before its death, showing a bond beyond utility. In the long gap between the genetic split and that grave, humans and certain wolf-like animals slowly learned to live side by side, a millennia-long proto-domestication likely rooted in Eurasia. From that slow partnership came the animal we know today, not just a tamed wolf but something entirely its own. From sled hauling arctic huskies to truffle sniffing hounds of providence, the domestic dog is now one species with hundreds of forms, each shaped by human need, vanity, or accident. They've steered and guarded flocks, hunted game, carried messages in war, and in Victorian parlors worn silk bows. Culturally, dogs occupy a rare position, both utility and family. They appear in mythology as guides to the afterlife, in law codes as property, and in modern urban apartments as dependents with dental plans. Genetically, they remain closer to wolves than we do to chimpanzees, yet behaviorally, they've crossed the chasm. Their survival strategy is symbiosis, the partnership that began in the Ice Age now spans every continent. As much as we humans have fashioned dogs in the greater tale of survival and culture, they may have changed us more than we them. Or not. We are closer in time to the earliest hard evidence of cat domestication than we are to the earliest hard evidence of dog domestication by about 4,000 years. And we are closer in time to the earliest hard evidence of cat domestication than we are to early proto-domestication of the dog by about 30,000 years. Humans have been brewing beer for at least 7,000 years in Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, long before we knew what yeast was. Early brewers relied on wild saccharomyces floating in the air or clinging to grain husks to turn sweet mash into alcohol. Each batch was a microbial gamble, saved only by reusing fermentation vessels that carried the right yeast. True domestication of Saccharomyces cerevisiae came much later, perhaps in the last 500 years or so as brewers began intentionally repitching the same yeast, selecting for strains that fermented quickly, tolerated alcohol, and produced consistent flavor. Industrial brewing in the 19th century, aided by Pasteur's work on fermentation, locked in specific strains, turning yeast from an invisible accident into a managed ingredient. Today's brewing yeasts are as specialized as racehorses, some descended from centuries-old lineages. The froth in your pint is the product of a partnership that began with chance and ended with one of the most carefully curated microbes on planet Earth. For this installment, let's close out with the big picture. We've got the doggies, we got the kitty cats, we got the horsies, and beer. And that's nice. Thanks for watching.